Welcome to the Protector Culture Podcast with Jimmy Graham. Jimmy is a veteran U.S. Navy SEAL, a former protective officer for the CIA Global Response Staff, founder and CEO of the Able Shepherd Program, a husband and father of four, and a personal friend of mine. Now here's Jimmy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Protector Culture Podcast with Jimmy Graham. I'm your host, Jimmy Graham, and this is BK, Able oh Shepherd 001051. There you go. So, I mean, we should have it by now. By oh, but once we broke a hundred, there's no excuses, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the benchmark. Yeah. And thank you, one. thank you. So, like a hundred and one times, probably more, because we've done other stuff. You have broken down gear, put this in. This is a multi-purpose. That's the shoot house. This is a classroom. That's like we basically just use this area as a studio, but we have to set up every time. So appreciate yeah, you, brother. No thank problem you. at all. Thank you. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. It's been a little bit of a, uh, a break. We have been. Um, I've been traveling a bit. I've been uh, to a wedding. I've been off to California a couple of times. There's just a lot is going on right now. Um, just some some good stuff, some bad stuff. We're going to talk about that a bit. I'm sure we'll talk more about. You know, there's um, as. Upon recording right now, last night, there was a horrific shooting. I, I haven't had time to read all of it. I've been getting updates in Maine. The last I heard yep. was 22 dead. Is that Oof. what you heard? It's about where I'm tracking. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've just been going all day, and I haven't looked again, and people have been helping me out and filling me in, digesting for me. So thoughts and prayers with those families of everyone affected. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, boots on the ground yesterday with Israel, and uh, that continues just to, I mean, it's, it's just getting started. So yeah. that's uh, one of the things that that is one of the instances we're going to talk about. And I don't want to make light of anything or poke, you know, I, I don't want to, um, the world needs to learn from this because like with, with, with Israel, I've heard many, many times, yeah, they're the best at it. They're good. And, I, and I've, I've trained, uh, I've been to Israel. We've trained and done war games and all that kind of stuff. And um, they are, they're fantastic and they must be fierce, right? They must be like, they're going to die if they're not, you know, no, one of the, uh, the best quotes I've heard that was repeated by my pastor, but I first heard it from Ben Shapiro and, and it's, it's not just him saying it, but a great way to put this into perspective is if Hamas put their guns down today, there would be peace. If Israel put their guns down, they would be brutally murdered. Right. Ooh, yeah. That really puts that it into it perspective. Yeah. And that is happening right now. And if you, uh, this will, this will cover some of the overall, I'm not going to really uh, dirt dive the overall, but there's one story right now that really touched me. Um, and encouraged me the, of, um, and we'll, we'll get into it. And this is, uh, ki, uh kibbutz methyl seam. And I'm hoping I'm getting that right. I'm just going to guess and don't, don't beat me up on this. Cause I'm not as ready as big Hebrew and, and I'll do my best on this, but a kibbutz is a it's community coming from a good place. Yeah. That's coming from the heart. See my heart, brother, not my pronunciation. So, uh, kibbutz, kibbutz methyl seam would be the community of methyl seam, right? Okay. And it's 200 acres. And it was attacked like many others. It was not far from the concert. So, you know, just, just at, at a, at a um, 30,000 foot view, um, it was a holy day. And man, I don't want to say they were caught sleeping, but they just relaxed. Complacency is, is, is just real. Like in, in, when, in Benghazi, Libya, there was so much complacency. I literally wrote people up. Like I wrote up my superiors, sent it back. And I'm like, it's just not okay. Right. And was called later after the attack on third, you know, thir um, shown in 13 hours of all that. Hey, did you really write this up? Did this really happen? Cause this is serious stuff. I'm like, absolutely. That's why I wrote it. Right. Would you testify to that? I absolutely would. Crickets never heard from again. Right. So mm -hmm. there was just absolute, just uh, complacency. It's a real thing. It happens all the time. Uh, but that man, we got the best fence. Nobody could ever do whatever. We got this, we got that. We see it in law enforcement locally. We got the police. They know what to do. I was asked my buddy, he's a cop. If you saw the training that most officers, not all, most patrol officers get for active shooter, you'd throw up. If you know what you're talking about, you'd throw up, right? It's not fair. It's not fair to them. We see this all the time and twice this past week or two weeks. Um, we, we assess, we watch, we try to help and all that stuff. And if you're being honest and you really want to get better, man, I'm all ears and I'll do anything for you. But a lot of people, it's not your fault necessarily that you don't know. It's your fault if you don't want to know, right? So if you've gotten to that point where you've stopped learning, bad on you. Yeah. Just bad on you, right? So not poking anybody in the eye, but we can all learn from this. This is coming. This is just getting started. There's a lot in here, um, and I want to point it out and just have a discussion about it. You down? I'm down, and one thing I'd like to keep in mind is um, you touched on the general idea that, oh, somebody else has this covered. Yeah. I think we're past that. Yeah. Quite yeah. a ways. We should be. We should be. Most people in their mind, they're not. They're like, someone will come rescue me. It's like the, uh, the flood in New Orleans. I'm just going to wait here until somebody gets me. No, it's on you. It's always been your job to save your life. 
It's always been your job to take care of your kids. It's your duty, it's your responsibility, and it is your honor to protect your people, period. Yeah. Right? It's like that whole um, police are a luxury, right? Something like this is going on, you call the police, they're simply not coming. And I've worked for a long time with small schools, in particular Christian schools. If there's a coordinated attack on your city, the small Christian school gets this many police. They get zero, zero police, right? They're going to the high school. They're going to the public school. The numbers make sense. They can protect more people if they go to the high school and they go to the big schools and all that stuff. And then they're out of resources. Yeah. They're not coming to your small couple hundred people, you know, Christian school. They're just not. It means you're up. It means it's on you. And the truth is, it always was, right? So when it, this is a, a buddy of mine. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you, brother. Um, he sent this and said, this is why you train. I, I know what you do. I know why you do it. He, he said this many times. I see what you're doing here. And he's come out and thanked people that we've, you know, we've used this property. We, we use other properties. We use all this stuff. And he's the host. And we're there to thank him. And he thanks us for training to protect American communities. Right, because he sees the writing on the wall, and he sent me this from the Wall Street Journal, and this is um, dated ten nineteen twenty three, or is that when I printed it? No, it's October seventeenth, um, and it's called "When Hamas Attacked, This Israeli Kibbutz Fought Back and Won." So, broad stroke, many of these communities um, were attacked, and people were kidnapped, people were murdered, people were raped, right. children were beheaded. Some of this is on video; much of it. Because it's a pride thing, and terrorism is ugly, and the the, um, the objective of terrorism is terrorize. So it's the worst possible thing I can do is going to make the biggest dent, right? We've already got alerts out locally. Um, we've already seen, you know, like I said, the shooting that happened last night. We're talking to people. Um, children. Protect children. Why? It's our heartstrings. It is the most innocent form of Jesus Christ on this planet is our children, both born and unborn. But even more so, more graphic, because we can't see it than, than killing unborn babies is killing small babies, yeah. right? Protect children. It's on you to protect children. Don't say this will never happen here. Don't say it, right? So I want to read this in its entirety, and we'll just comment and all that stuff. Throw a finger up and give me a signal, because I'm just going to work through it as a Phil led. I'll just comment and just chime in wherever. Down. I know, I'm man. Ready. This one this one gets me I'm fired ready. up, because I just briefed it and pulled my highlighter out, and I'm all fired up again, just to start off with. But this is serious stuff. I, I feel... A little bit, um, I don't say proud. Um, <clears throat> I'm honored by this community, by the things that we've seen and done just here at a low threat deal. Yeah. Um, and I've learned a lot just by looking at this. And um, we've talked a lot about being prepared, meaning that root cellar mentality of just living a, a different lifestyle, not just to and from the store. If something happened, there's, uh, there's supplies, there's ammunition, there's guns. The biggest thing on that card that we give out called two and 10 card yep. is community. It's yep. always community. It's always, always, if the problem is people, the solution will always, always, always be people. Mm -hmm. People say technology. I said, technology exists to make a human response more effective. It doesn't replace it. Not ever. Guns aren't the answer. It's always the answer. In this, it's stem shooting. There's 300 guns in the parking lot one hour too late. It's always the answer, right? So what is efficiency? Get it there quicker. Get guns and people know how to use them. They're quicker and make that person stop killing kids. That's the deal, right? So this is by David S. Cloud. We'll put the link in here so you can read it in its entirety, but we're going to walk through it. So at 6.56 a.m. on October, October 7th, bear with me, Moshi, I think it's Moshi Kaplan, sent an urgent, an urgent message to his volunteer security force in Mephalsim, a kibbutz of 1,000 men, women, and children in southern Israel, where he served as a security chief. So even right there, this is early, early morning, you know, roughly 7 o'clock in the morning on a holiday, right? Uh, and now you're sending out uh, an urgent thing to his security team, which was built. If there's a team, it means it was planned and it was built. Um, and out there, you've been overseas, there's compounds. I kind of like yeah. that, yeah. right? It's yeah. like a fence or a wall. And stay off my property. So if you're in my yard, something's really wrong because you didn't just walk in the grass. You had to yeah. climb a fence, right? And it's it's there's a there's an absolute reason for that. That's why I spoke and presented uh, a couple of years ago at the conservative uh, Western Conservative Summit about how we're going to build schools in the future, right? I'm not getting a lot of traction on that. It's unfortunate, and I said it then. Unfortunately, more kids are going to have to die before people listen to this, right? Because it just messes up your, your pocketbook. Um, in quotes, there's a shooting in the village from the gate. He texted after militants fired at his car as he drove past the main entrance. Attackers later blew open a pedestrian gate nearby with explosives and flooded into the kibbutz. The kibbutz. Uh, Kaplan rushed home to grab his armored vest, helmet, and M16 rifle. It means he will grab. He went home to grab his stuff. 
He didn't run to the store and say, can I buy stuff? Yeah, yeah. means he was prepared, right? Then drove back off to check another gate at the northwest corner. There he found armed men were already inside the razor wire security fence that encircled the community. So guys are already in the compound. Mm -hmm. Roughly 200 acres of where we train over dance. Yep. That's roughly, you know, it's, it's shy of that. But it's 200 acres, not so big, right? But, I mean, houses and all that kind of stuff. But it's not like a city. Nope. It's your neighborhood, right? Um, terrorist in the kibbutz. Terrorist in the kibbutz, he yelled in a, um, in a second panicked voice text, begging his men to hurry. Gunshots sounded in the background. Uh, he had trained a dozen men for this moment, a surprise attack from nearby Gaza. Yet 19 minutes after his first alert, none had arrived. So here's already 19, 19 minutes in, waiting. Wow. He calls, bringing the boys and all that stuff. Um, but they already had a trained element, but it was a holiday. And I just want to highlight that. Um, Kaplan left his car. Kaplan, maybe. Kaplan left his car and shot at assailants from behind a metal gar uh, garbage container. One lobbed a hand grenade at him, and a stroke of luck for him and Mephal Seem, it didn't explode. Um, if I would have read that to my five year old daughter um, and said, I was lucky the grenade didn't go off, she'd say, You're not lucky, you're blessed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Graham's family saying, I don't believe in luck, right? I don't believe yeah. in luck. He was blessed, right? More than two dozen Hamas fighters from Gaza had arrived with orders to subdue the small security force and herd hostages into the community dining hall. They carried a detailed map of the kibbutz of your community, uh, like other assailant teams in, um, in southern Israel that morning, an attack plan labeled top secret, right? So they had plans, a lot of planning that went in to murder, to kidnap, to hold hostages, to take hostages, to do all that kind of stuff. That's how they know this stuff. Mephal Seem was one place that day where nothing for the Hamas attackers went according to plan. Also not in this article, um, I read somewhere else, um, in these vehicles they found cocaine and cot. Cot, um, I don't remember, there's a, there's a longer name, Cap Season or something like that. But Cot, if you remember Black Hawk Down, From they were Africa. all chewing Cot, they get hyped right? It's that, basically yeah. that drug that fuels terrorism is what they call it. But it's like yeah. they're, 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 they're high and they're running for it. And, um, and, and um, Jack Hibbs did an amazing um, um, deal on, is it What's Happening or Real News or something like that, one of his podcasts with um, Amir Cervante. Awesome, awesome, awesome. They don't pull any punches and they talk about it. But it came way back from, I think, the British who were saying, you know, um, I forget. I'm not going to mess that up. But um, they're not going down, right? So they, 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 um, they commissioned uh, a guy named Colt to make a, a, a bigger bullet called the Colt 45, and they called it the Muslim Stopper, right? Yeah. I don't look that up because that was Jack Hibbs talking about that. But it's like um, I know that there's been people in, in, in my ranks that have said, these dudes are not going down. They actually, um, they requested optics so they could start shooting dudes in the head, right? Because they're like, man, these guys are stopping, right? So that cot drugged up, mm. full of hate, full of, you know, just, just evil. And they're coming, and they're coming, they're all in, right? And that, that's where I was going to go when, uh, A, there's no rules. Yeah. When you served, there was rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. You could and could not. They have no rules. Yeah. So anything goes, walk up, punch you in the face. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Be ready for it. And then I don't know how I could ever put words to it unless you've seen it. But when you see pure evil in somebody's eyes, yes. it is terrifying. Nothing is going to stop them. Yeah. They are so gung-ho, so full of whatever the drugs may be and whatever is being put into their brains. And keep in mind as well, at least when I was over there, that's 45 years ago, there's really not a good education system, meaning the people I came across, most of them didn't read. Everything is storytelling. Yeah. It's handed down. So if you're told something, okay, that's how I do it. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that really, uh, yeah, I'm going to say it, it scares me. Yeah. Because our borders are porous. Yeah. These people that I saw many moons ago, they're walking around. Yeah. They're coming. And this is a religious battle. Yeah. Make no mistake, Israel is what the holy ground. There's three religions I know of fighting for that one piece of dirt. Yeah. They're not giving up. Most of the world only understands a language that Americans wholesale don't speak, right? We are like uh, Jason. What's up, 86er? He, he said he, he likes to say in the land of milk and honey and fine cashmere, <laughs> right? That's where we are. Like, yep. it's uh -huh. like we are so soft and that you should aspire to be civilized and all that stuff. And some people press themselves to be hardened, right? And I think it's a good balance to do that and to study uh, what, what Jordan Peterson would call atrocities. 
Because you need to be, you need to understand what people are capable of when they don't have a, a right and wrong, when they don't have a, when they, they when just, or the, when they, they have nothing to when lose. nobody's, when they think nobody's hmm. looking and they don't have a God that walks, looks down and judges on that. So, um, soon after Kaplan's call, for help, his volunteers rushed from their homes in helmets and protective vests worn over the T-shirts they had slept in toting M16 rifles. There's no time. There's no time to get on your battle fatigues. There's no time to, it's like, man, you got a, your, your Hanes, you know, tag this T-shirt on, and, and you just throw on your stuff, and you got your, you know, your board shorts on, hopefully, and not your skivvies, and you're <laughs> out there getting looms. after it, right? And it's like, hey, brother, combat Fruit of Looms. Outnumbered and, and uh, fighting alone or in pairs, the men mounted a life-or-death stand communicating via walkie-talkie and WhatsApp text to trap the mili- uh, to track the militants and send each other um, help. So they're communicating via their phone yeah. apps and their walkie-talkies, right? Um, as you know, we have two commercial repeaters placed, one in Castle Rock, one on Highland Ranch. We have radios that are some inexpensive, but you can get the digital ones yeah. around $250, $300, and they're very, very effective. What radios will do nowadays, blow my mind. I used to, like literally... Um, you know this, uh, a radio used to be this big, and then it had two huge batteries that were this big and heavy, and an encryption device, and you tape them together, and you ran cables like this, and you ran an antenna, and I get a directional satellite, and I'd point at the satellite, azimuth and elevation, so I could point, aim at the satellite. Then I can send a picture to Washington, D.C. Wow. You know what it looks like now? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's like, an iPhone. This is way, it's like 50 times better than all that garbage, right? And probably more secure. Um, you know, within but context. the key point or takeaway from that is they had a coordinated communication. That's plan. right. That's right. Whatever. And man. they knew how to use the device. Yeah. If it was a WhatsApp or a walkie yeah. talkie, they knew how to use it. They knew the right channel. The, the, uh, so map and compass, getting out of map, getting out of compass is like the tried and true and it works and all that kind of stuff. And it was funny because a lot of people, old school guys get stuck in this and they say, what if this doesn't work? And I said, what if it does? You know, yeah. Like if you get a GPS, what, is, what if this what if this thing fails you? Like what if it doesn't work? I go, what if it does? We get there way more efficient. <laughs> know this, then use this. Yeah. This is backup, brother. <laughs> you know, go for efficiency. So if that thing works, you get after it. If you're yelling at your phone and then that it comes up and you hear that dude, that's comms, baby. Yep. I'm I'm transmitting and you're receiving. They believe that they had to hold off the insurgents long enough for the Israeli army to arrive. At first, they hoped the soldiers would be there quickly, but as minutes passed and the fighting grew worse, they realized they would have to fight alone. Where are the tanks? Um, Yarden Reskin, uh, Yarden Reskin, a 38-year-old landscape architect and security volunteer, yelled into his walkie-talkie as the bullets flew. It became very, very apparent they weren't coming. He said later, Palestinian gunmen who gunmen who f- uh, flooded out of the of Gaza killed 1,400 Israelis and took close to 200 hostages, terrorizing and shooting people at more than two, uh, 20 Israeli towns and military bases and thousands at an all-night music festival not far from uh, Mephil Sin. Uh, in, in town after town, attackers blasted through security fences that encircled Israeli villages near Gaza, gunning down residents, burning houses and families inside and taking hostages. Bodies at the, at the burned up cars of people fleeing the music festival and an early, tar- an early target uh, were later found outside Mephelsim's main gate. Um, frightened families at the kibbutz, a 200-acre close-knit community with farm fields and tree-li- tree-lined streets, took refuge in home shelters, some watching accounts of, ass- of assaults in nearby towns on phones and TVs. They heard heavy gunfire just outside. These security things, as I understand it, that we, we found this out, by law, by politics, you can't lock them. So you got a safe room, you can't lock. Israeli is very, very strict on not only guns, but bullets. Yeah. You get assigned bullets and you have to go to an authorized gun range, shoot them, account for them before you get more. Wow. Right? This is absolutely ridiculous, stupid. It's like the California, your guns can go there and your bullets can go there. You're an idiot, right? Because whose job is it to protect your kids? It's mine, mine, right? Are you effective? No, I'm an idiot. I got my gun over there and I got my bullets over here and I can't protect my children. You don't need permission to protect your kids, right? That's a God-given right. So protect your children. Um, there's a story. I'll t- I'll, well, okay, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay, so that a lady come through. The POP, Protecting Our People, also stands for uh, Principles of Protection. That is, um, she, she, she came through and she shared a story as, you know, as we were wrapping up. And we're like, hey, what brought you here? And all that kind of stuff. And she says, well, um, very affluent neighborhood. She had family over. She had, you know, guests over and all this other stuff. They've got a nanny, German lady that lived in the basement. In the middle of the night, they hear glass breaking and screaming. Mm. And a woman had climbed in, drugged out, 
had climbed into the basement or whatever. She was in the basement attacking the nanny by breaking a, a, a picture, like frame oh. over her face, whatever. But she's like a German like athlete, evidently, and she's holding her own and like she starts beating up this whatever. So all the screaming's going on, and I believe the husband goes downstairs, and other guests are kind of like in the room, like I'm not coming out, right? Uh, I think mother-in-law was there, if I remember correctly, but the husband's like, and she told us, like good Californians, our guns are that way and our bullets are that way. And it's happening right now. Yeah. And we yeah. hear blood curling screams coming. So I think he grabs a golf club or maybe like an, an antique, not sharp sword. I forget exactly what it was. And starts going down the stairs like full fiction or something. <laughs> like, what's happening right now? And he goes down there. And then they subdue this lady. And as they're subduing her and she's screaming her head off, she looks up and she goes, I'm not alone. My boyfriend's going to kill you all. And they're like, there's somebody else in my house. But the kids are upstairs, and now all the commotion has brought everybody downstairs. So they're freaking out. And then they go upstairs and all this other stuff, and there wasn't another person. She's a crazy person. And then the police show up, a SWAT team, you know, whatever. They said SWAT team, but it was like long guns on their back deck, and it really affected her. Like, you don't see, nope. you know, this kind of firearms and firepower and all this stuff, and it just really rocked her. Anyways, like a good Californian, whatever. So it's just, it's just ridiculous. Well, I think that, um, you've mentioned this in a handful of episodes um, that kind of distraction tactic. Yeah. And even yeah, in we'll this episode, the episode, you opened, Look that way. the police are going to go to a public high school. Uh, the numbers are there. The percentages are there. Watch out for the distraction because everybody goes yeah. to site number one. What's happening over there? Yeah. Horrible book that you must read, um, Day of Wrath. Right? Okay. It's compiled. It's, it's a fiction book. It's compiled off of real things that have happened, just not in this country. It's look over there and let's pull all the cops out of town. Let's hit that school. Yep. Right. And it would work every bit of it. If you, the, the fact that that book exists is dangerous. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. Yeah. Right. So we're not ready it's for a playbook, it. So we'd yeah. have to, but you know, so it is not enough, uh, um, police officers to take care of that, but there's enough men or is there, right? or are, are there enough men? Um, we didn't know what all the shooting meant. Said, um, said Gil Levi 17, who was home with her mother in ball, Younger, uh, younger brother, ne uh, Noam Levi, and boyfriend, uh, Ophir Itamari. Her father, Eli Levi, um, had told them not to come out of the shelter no matter what. He was in the living room, standing watch through the plate glass window facing the southern fence in the kibbutz and, um, in the, kibbutz and the fields that stretch beyond. This is in the house. <laughs> like You're fighting and defending from your living room through the plate glass window. When Levi saw militants heading toward the fence, he shot his M16 through the window. All his family could hear uh, inside the shelter was the sound of gunfire. Not his bolt-action rifle, not his shotgun, his M16, the thing that would do the job against people that have something similar. Um, there were the terrorists inside the house, Gil Levi recalled thinking. Kids are in there in a shelter that they can't lock calling it a safe room, and they hear dad blasting through the plate glass window, and they think people are upstairs killing him, right? Uh, Gil's boyfriend handed her um, a souvenir. It's a souvenir Japanese knife he had found in the shelter and a pair of scissors uh, to her mother in case they had to fight off the intruders themselves. That's about as real as it gets, man. I'm going to hand you a pair of scissors. And, you know, we've talked to, to teachers about Cutco scissors. Mm -hmm. Take them apart. If you can't have a gun, put some scissors in there. And ones you couldn't break if you tried, like serious, like daggers. Um, and it's ridiculous substitute for a firearm, but yep. it is what it is. It's something. Yeah. One against four is what this section is called. The night before the attack on, um, on Methalseem, around 30 families had spent the night camping in an olive grove outside the gate. It was, an, it was an annual community outing on the last night of the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. We camp quite a bit. You yes. know, so imagine you're out there doing your thing and you're spending time with your kids and you got your fire and you go to sleep. And as you're waking up before you smell the bacon cooking for us, not that <laughs> it's like, um, you hear gunfire, right? Um, in the morning around 6.30 a.m., sirens wailed of incoming rockets from Gaza, a wail so common in local communities that even the children treated it as routine, right? I've seen this. I've been, well, and I don't, do I want to admit this? <laughs> Working with the CIA, I've been on base where you get bombed so much, you don't even get out of bed. The sirens go off and you're like, man, these aren't even, they're not, you know. Well, and you open with complacency. It's all it the time, happens, right? The it's time. like you're in and out of bed. And, and then you're like, you know what? These things aren't even accurate. And if it's my time, it's my time, which isn't the right thing to do. But when it's all the time, I got to work tomorrow and I got to be sharp and all that kind of stuff. But I've been sitting there, what comes to mind? I'm in Kosovo with the guys. We're all mounted up and we're doing this stuff. We stop for a minute and I don't know what we're doing. I'm sitting outside the vehicles and, um, these kids are playing soccer and they don't have any shoes on in the gravel. Just hard. Hard because you got to be, right? And, uh, and you hear 
gunfire. Grr, grr. We all jump over and look over, and it's just outside of view in the next block. And the kids stop game, look up. We're good, and they start. They're not shooting at us. Oh gosh, you know that's just what. That's life. It's like, oh, they're not shooting at us. I thought they're shooting at us. Anyways, game on. You know how we do the, you yeah. know, game on. You know, it's a car. Game on. They're, like, no, they're not shooting at us. Game on. It's just a different oh, world, right? But it, that, but that, it does getting that. Um, well, another guy. Here we go. Um, when Shaqid Porat, 43, heard the sirens at the campsite, he roused his uh, two sleeping children. And this hits close. A 10-year-old daughter and a 6-year-old son. Right? I'm like, ooh, mm. those, those yep. ages just mm. line up a little too close for home, right? And quickly drove home, uh, entering through a back gate. At home, the children joined Parat's wife and their 12-year-old son in the family shelter. Uh, Parat listened to the urgent voice text from Kaplan about gunmen at the northwest gate. His phone showed the battery was at 10%. Wah, wah, wah. That's, that stinks, man, when you're like, I need comms bad now. And you look down, and it's, it's, you're almost done. Um, Parat, an Israeli um, army veteran and one of the volunteers in MFL Seam Security Force, ran out his door with an M16 and hustled to a street lined with houses uh, on one side and a kibbutz gate on the other. About 40 yards away, he saw four armed men in vests and black jeans. Thinking he recognized one of them, pause. I posted a thing on, I was on a horse with a rifle, with an M16, an AR, and riding a horse. Me and Mike Davis were riding on yeah. stuff. We got cowboy hats on. I, no, I had a ball cap on. And we're riding horses at a full run with, with ARs. Because why wouldn't you? It's America. <laughs> it's America. But on that, I made a meme and I said, America's next war will be fought in blue jeans. Hmm. And I was like, when I made it, I was like, anyways, we'll leave it at that. But that, that, that's what I thought of when I saw that. I'm like, man, fast forward 10 years. Yep. Thinking he recognized one of them, he called out, Saucy, the Hebrew nun, nickname of another member of the volunteer force. Tal. Uh, one of them responded, meaning, come here in Arabic. Part realized that they were militants and started shooting. So I thought I knew you. Called a name. You respond in another language, and I start blasting, right? Uh, two of the armed men ran toward uh, nearby houses for cover. Two others hid um, hid behind a parked car. Parat, who had been in firefights as a soldier, ducked into a small concrete enclosure for trash cans. Um, it's a very lonely feeling, he said later, especially uh, when you're one against four. A resident who watched the exchange of gunfire with an upstairs window yelled a warning Parat. They are throwing grenades! Parat ducked and escaped injury. When one of the militants ran uh, from a yard to the open, Parat shot him. 40 yards, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, a second attacker raised his head from behind a car, and Parat said he, uh, he shot him too. He saw a third gunman running away. The fourth attacker disappeared, and Parat, who stayed put for the next hour, guarding the kibbutz gate, um, to keep out any others. Photos, uh, photos taken later showed two dead men, one on the sidewalk, one on the street. This is called Trapped. Video from a security camera at the main gate of Mephalsim captured some of the carnage that took place outside of the main gate of the kibbutz as the people fled the outdoor music festival that tried desperately to get inside, pursued by militants. A man in a white shirt was shot as he ran toward the entrance. He grabbed his right arm and dropped to the pavement, blood spilling from around his head. Armed fighters emerged from a wooden... The wooded area. Uh, minutes later, several ran to the fallen man. Uh, several ran to the fallen man and shot him again. Drivers who abandoned cars to hide in the bushes were attacked with grenades. A person pulled from the bushes was shot and bludgeoned with a rifle butt. The video was posted by South First Responders, a group of emergency personnel working in southern Israel, and verified by the Wall Street Journal. After militants blew open. The entrance at the kibbutz gate, <coughs> excuse me, and streamed inside, Kaplan kept on the move. Worried residents would leave their houses in a danger. Someone sent out a message to stay in the houses and not come out, Kaplan said in a what's up, what's app voice message, breathing heavily. Emergency task force, come to me. Emergency task force, come to me. They are splitting up. Shots cracked in the background. Good comms when you're about to get flanked, right? So if yeah. people are moving and shooting and all that stuff, if you can't talk and you stay put, you're, you're already dead if they know what they're doing, right? Yep. Um, and again... We've done that, right? It's not real complex stuff that we've introduced to some of these people that have never done it, done it but they know what a flank is. Yep. They know how to flank and they know how not to get flanked or at least how to see it because why? Because if you're moving around and it doesn't have to be a military type thing, it just means that if I'm here and you're right next to me, you've got the same angle as me. Yep. So if you're about hiding behind a rock, we can't get you. But if you're over there and I'm over here, I start moving this way, you start moving that way. One of us is going to get you. So if you stay put, you're done. You yeah. must move, right? And if you know that and can counter it, then you've got a chance. And if you don't, you're already dead. Um, over the next hour, there were several gunshots. Secured. The next hour, 
right? Whew. So, you know that vest in there that we recommend? Man, you know how much how many people are like, dude, what are you, are you crazy? This isn't the SEAL teams. Yeah. I'm like, right, but you've got a, a rifle and, uh, and the mag that came with the, the AR. <laughs> That's what you got, right? Um, if you need extra bullets, don't be showing up with a Home Depot bucket full of loose bullets, right? <laughs> load mags, and yeah. I want to see six on your body and one on the gun, right? Well, that's load up, right? You can always manipulate a load up, but you own it, right? Yeah. Why not? Because of this is why not, because an hour, right? Um, and then that was one of the things with small unit tactics. If they keep us here, we're dead. We all knew that. So you have to shoot and move, but you need bullets to shoot and move, right? So yeah. if you stop, you're, you're, you're done in some sense, instances. Security volunteers hunted for the militants who were moving uh, alone and in, and in pairs in residential streets. Two attackers were killed in the garden of a house by four Israeli soldiers who were home on a weekend leave. Two of the soldiers suffered minor wounds from a grenade, fr from, from grenade fragments. Everybody out there serves in some capacity, right? That's really, really good. Yeah. One, you've yeah. got skin in the game of your country. I'm not saying that everybody should serve in the military. And by the grace of God, people should not. In <laughs> the military, they should never have guns. But that service thing is a big deal, right? Because now it's your country. Yep. Like you served your country. That's, it's, it's a big deal. Um, Ruskin, the landscape architect, uh, came within sight of the main gate and saw a large group of attackers exchanging what looked like congratulations. He fired and they scattered. The next, um, he next went into a nearby residential neighborhood and joined Idan Merovich, the team's medic. As they walked, they saw Idan Kadash, a resident, shooting with a handgun from his window, and he joined their patrol. Run with your brung, brother. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I wanted to make sure that we talked about this, not because I'm, you know, anything wrong with that. It just means I know people that are like, um, we shoot, we've shot at 100 yards, at even 200 yards with a pistol. It can be done. It can yeah. be, you know, and uh, people say, was that, is that effective? It's like, you don't get to pick the distance. You don't get to pick the day. You have a choice. If you've got a handgun and somebody's shooting at you from 100 yards, you got a choice. Shoot it out. Yep. Right? And if you have to shoot, you should know where your hits are going to be, right? Yeah. So that's just, it's, it's good to know what you got. Uh, and, you know, the handgun should be used to get you to your rifle, right? Yeah. I love that that story of the, the sheriff that's at a party and, you know, at a, at, a, at a gathering at some kind of gala, and a woman walks up and goes, Sheriff, you've got your pistol on. Expecting trouble? And he says, no, if I was expecting trouble, I'd have brought my rifle, right? So <laughs> having that uh, a handgun is right now up close and personal, but not just that, right? So having that, um, Jordan Peterson said it best. I love the way it articulates things, and evidently so does the world. Um, a man should be formidable. Yeah, right? absolutely. Because it, 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 it reminds the world where to step. A man, and women, I'm not leaving you out, but I'm talking to men. A man should own a good rifle and a good pistol, and know how to use them, period, Both. period. And I'm talking about jujitsu and kung fu. I'm not talking about any of that. The first thing you do is a pistol and a rifle, a quality ones that you're going to give to your son someday, and run them like an extension of your body. Then anything else you do, and I know, back that up. The first thing is character. If yeah. you don't have character, please don't buy a gun. No. Don't mess with guns. you got no business with a gun, right? If yeah. you're not professional, if you're not responsible, if you don't have character, just go ahead and take a pass on that. After that, to be formidable, a, uh, I, would, I would say an AR platform and a quality pistol. Yep. Right. Um, and know them. Um, Join their patrol. Two militants walked in front of an elderly woman's house with their rifles on their shoulders, one holding a stolen, uh, a stolen children's bike. Uh, before the attackers saw the three defenders, Ruskin fired and they ran. A militant, a militant driving a stolen forklift was heading for the main gate, apparently intending to stack cars there and block an expected counterattack from Israeli army. From the Israeli army, Ruskin said he shot at the forklift and the driver abandoned the vehicle. Another group of militants made their way to a dormitory uh, for foreign workers employed. A dormitory for uh, foreign workers employed in the kibbutz farm operations. A dozen Thai workers hiding there um, were loaded at gunpoint into a wagon, pulled a uh, wagon pulled by a tractor that steered toward the front gate. They were intercepted by the security volunteers. One of the kibbutz defenders shot at the wagon, and the militants fled, leaving the workers behind. So they saved their worker guys. <clears throat> Last stand. Um, what this is called. Almost an hour after the battle erupted from the front gate. So they're an hour in now. The fighting shifted to Methal Seam's southern perimeter. David D.D. Rosenberg, uh, a member of the volunteer force, stood on his second floor balcony where he kept watch on Methal Seam's southern fence. Armed with his M16, his wife, who was in the home shelter with their two children, texted him, I'm scared. He suggested games to play with the kids. Rosenberg, whose balcony overlooked the fence, reported over his walkie-talkie that a truck carrying a dozen armed men and motorcycle ferrying two gunmen were roaring across an open field toward the fence. Levi, 48, again, these guys are like, 
our age, roughly, right? A little younger, but my age? What's Your up? age. What's up, old school? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you're not that much older than me, but, but you know, you know, uh, 50-ish around there. The head of security um, and emergency management for Intel, okay, I'm sorry, Levi, 48, the head of security and emergency management for Intel in Israel, uh, had also been watching the southern perimeter through his living room window, and he saw the attackers uh, when they were about um, 100 yards away. Levi, a former Israeli soldier, said he froze for a few seconds thinking of the danger to his family. Then he heard uh, Rosenberg, a few houses away, open fire, uh, prompting Levi to start shooting at attackers from his uh, living room window. Uh, Noam, Noam Kazaz, 52, who had evacuated with his family to the house um, to the house of another kibbutz resident shortly after his own was hit by a rocket called Rosenberg. We will die on the fence. No one is entering the kibbutz, uh, he recalled saying before he opened fire. Three volunteers hadn't trained to shoot at such far range, but their heavy gunfire prompted the motorcycle driver to turn around. The men riding on the truck jumped off and flattened on the ground. Levi thought he could see several had been hit. Um, what most people think is far distances, right? I heard 100 yards, and I know 200 acres, right? Mm -hmm. So um, not edge to edge, it's within. So that... M16, they're calling it. And I saw it. It's, it's iron sights, right? So most upgrades with a red dot or some kind of optic, uh, that will easily, we test to 400 yards on what we yep. call patrol. It'll do yep. well past that, by the way, right? But effective, can you get it quick? And it's testable and all that kind of stuff to receive a standard uh, to, in protection for, for um, Abel Shepard. It's 200 and ingradable. That's kind of the standard, right? For the short, what used to be the arm brace on a yep. 10 and a half yep. inch barrel, right? Very, very effective. Very similar to what I carried in the CIA to protect people all over the world, except mine had full auto, right? And it was a, a piston drive, whatever, um, and a little higher quality. But what you can buy right now uh, legally with a 16 inch barrel, you, know, you can set it up for speed indoors, uh, but this patrol thing is exactly what's needed for this. It's just mm -hmm. some low low powered optic, you know, uh, variable powered, uh, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. via, uh, Whatever, what's the next word? Um, LVPO, low, LVPO, variable, low power, power variable, low power variable, lock, LPVO. Um, or an ACOG, you know, not even a variable. It's, uh, an ACOG is a battle proven optic that I really, really like. They're yep. really expensive, but you can beat that price wise and still get good quality. So you don't have to break the bank to get something that will easily shoot 400 yards, yep. right? Little bit of training. You know, people like uh, that haven't shot at all those distances, we teach them how it works, dial it in, and they're passing, right? So it's very, very doable. Um, so, it just, it, like I said, you don't get to pick the distance, right? If you're, yeah. you're going to defend this 200-acre thing, you should shoot at those distances and see what happens, right? Um, they kept shooting for the next 90 minutes until Israeli soldiers arrived at Levi's house. I'm from the squad. I'm from the squad, Levi yelled to the soldiers. I'm an Israeli. Please don't shoot me. Comms, baby. Can you start, start <laughs> communicating? Uh, we say it this way. When, when people are coming... You know they're coming, and they have the authority to come. It's not their job to not shoot you. It's your job to not get shot. Yeah. It means you better put your gun down and start yelling until we figure this out, or they're going to bury you right here, right? Or you shoot a good man, or yeah. he does, right? So we've got to make sure that we, we expect that when, that when that happens, even in a school, in a church, in a whatever. Uh, then he went into the shelter and hugged his family, of course. Instead of staying amid the shattered glass in their living room, they went to Rosenberg's house for the comfort of being with their neighbors. Uh, Israeli soldiers spent the following three days going house to house looking for any attackers who might still be hiding in the kibbutz. The bodies of eight militants were recovered. One resident said two more were killed after troops found them hiding in a cow shed. Another was captured. The rest were driven off. No Mephalsim residents were killed or taken hostage. Wow. Protected by a dozen residents, many of them former Israeli soldiers who had prepared for years to defend the kibbutz. A dozen dudes protected a community of a thousand because they were prepared, yeah. right? They were mentally prepared. They had the stuff, and they probably were, obviously, they're camping, they're living their life, not in fear, just like, hey, we got to do this, now let's get on with living, right? Wow. But on this day, it was test day, right? Yep. And it's winner take all. We say that here, we use kind of hard language because you need to hear it. Um, if you have to defend your children, it's winner take all. Especially with women, you go like, ah, you got to defend yourself. They're like, nah, whatever. You're like, hey, it's winner take all. And they go, winner take my kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They go, give me those scissors, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it changes because there's skin in the game. So if you've got something to defend, we say to get to them, you got to go through me, and that's hard, right? And it should be hard. But if it's easy, it's winner take all. Uh, that should change your mindset. Now, Falsim also got lucky. Eden Joy, mm. did they get lucky? <laughs> they're not lucky. They're blessed. 
Thank you, baby. Okay. But Volsin <laughs> didn't get lucky, but Volsin was very blessed. Although the defenders didn't know exactly how many attackers infiltrated the kibbutz, they estimated it was probably around 25 to 30, a group smaller than those um, that attacked the other local communities, which suffered far more casualties. Um, they still may have been able to hold them off. You know, that resistance part of it, I don't know, I'm not going to speculate. Residents departed uh, after the um, residents departed after the battle. Many of them relocated to a beachfront hotel north of Tel Aviv. Mephel Seem has been declared a military zone and is closed. Most of the residents say they will return and rebuild their home. There is a there is a feeling of discomfort that we survived and others did not. Survivor's guilt. I totally get it. Yeah. I totally get it. Um, there is a feeling of discomfort when other people survived. When 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 you survived and others didn't. Um, the way that I say that after this gives. Um, you know, if this helps anybody, is everything is required of you. For some, it's all at once. Yeah. Others, it's over a lifetime, right? So it's an honor to be living, and my time is now. Yep. You know, honor to yep. serve for time such as this. Everything I do, I consider it continued service. Because I've got buddies that, that, that didn't get to live to raise a family of four beautiful children and be married to Rachel, a yep. woman like Rachel, right? Yep. So it is an absolute duty it is an absolute responsibility. It is an absolute privilege to be able to do that. Um, but I get it. I get it. I think, I think about this quite a bit. I don't think in an unhealthy way. I think in a healthy way that is emotional. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because um, it's fuel. It truly is. Uh, Security Chief Kaplan said, but Mephel Seem at least had survived. So, so much to unpack in that. Um this thing over there has just, just begun. Yes. This is going to be really bad, and we're going to feel it. We already are, you know, in, in Maine and, and, uh, and seeing what's going on in this country. And a couple things that I say to keep myself sane and, to, and, and help others is I uh, can't make sense out of nonsense. This is nonsense. So don't try to make sense of it, right? But understand it and understand that now, this can't happen. It must happen. It must happen. It's going to happen. It's in your Bible. It's going to happen. What are you going to do? While it's happening, that's what you're in charge of. The things that you yeah. can control are what are you going to do while this happens? I choose love one another. More specifically, take care of one another, right? It's in the Bible, book yep. of John, love one another. Um, that's what I'm going to be doing, even if it looks like this. Hope it doesn't. No. Oof. But, right, um, to, to have a game plan. Um, the formidable thing it doesn't mean, we talked about that, it doesn't mean by a gun. It means the character piece of it. Man, you better start building that now. Like, yeah. I'm, you know, yeah. you've already done this. I'm growing a man at the house and three amazing young ladies. Yeah. And this thing is not an accident. You no. know, this started then, right? So that take care of one another and standing up for what's right and doing all that, know the truth and the truth will set you free could just never be truer, right? It's like, yeah. it's so, it's so good. It's so valuable right now. Uh, to, to just take the take all the energy out of the negative by just simply speaking the truth boldly. Um, I was very honored, Kevin, what's up, brother, um, to get a call from a buddy that was a protective officer with me. Uh, last week, he texted me, and and he just, you know, kind of, what's up? You know, hey, what's going on, brother? Uh, you got time to talk? Yeah, sure, whenever you want. And he's like, yeah, let's figure it out. And just, it's been busy, right? I've been out of time yeah. trying to catch up. And he's yeah, I got some questions about faith. I'm like, ooh, ooh, you know? So anyways... Um, woke up thinking about it and then just, and it just cold called him. Like, Hey, and he picked up, like, it's a good time. Sorry, man. Just whatever. And he's like, Oh, no problem. Was like, and it was super cool. And he was talking, I forget there's this whole black magic called podcast and social <laughs> media and all that stuff. Um, there's people watching us yeah. all over the country that have unbelievable resumes and history and history with me and all this other stuff. And you just move on, but you forget about that. You know, you forget that you walked with giants you know, at one point with the SEAL teams and CIA and all that kind of stuff. And there's just, there's, there's history that will never be written yep. down, yep. right? And it was necessary to, you know, to build a nation and maintain it. Um, but he starts talking and he was like, the, um, really respect for doing all that kind of stuff. So I, asked, I had some questions of faith and how to stand, how to talk about all this stuff. And it was just awesome. Yeah. And one of the things, and, and, and um, I didn't get permission, brother, but I, I don't think you'll mind. But he was talking about like, you know, it's easy to fall into the church's week these men's groups and all this kind of stuff that I'm hanging out with, it's just, it's just, the, it's the diet version or what I say, the suburbanite version of it. It's, and I live in the suburbs and I've got, you know, an SUV and I got a labradoodle. <laughs> 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 like your new snuggle buddy. Um, 
And I do, I wonder if I'm as fast, as sharp as I was. And the answer is no, man, I'm 49 years old and I don't work out every day to do that job, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it's like the stuff we used to do was crazy and and uh, and, and it's good because that should be something you aspire to do, uh, but it does concern me a little bit, right? But anyways, I said, this is what I've, I've come to find and, and, you know, just for my well-being is you search for a leader or a group um, and if you can't find that leader, it means it's you, yep. right? So you got to model it. The thing that you can't find, how many guys in that group, whether it's a church men's group or it's a whatever, are thinking the same thing, like, really, dude? Basketball again? Another <laughs> barbecue to talk about the problems with the world we're not going to face? You know, all that mm. kind of stuff. Um, and if you said, and I, and I told him, this is the way we do it. I'm not in charge of you, but I'm going to go do something healthy, and, and you're invited, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm going to, like, this whole thing, this whole creation thing, and men and lead from the front, and adventure and danger and wildness, I'm going to go in those mountains on a motorcycle, and you're invited. I'm going to go do this, and you're invited. I'm going to go do that, and you're invited. So I'm going to go, you know, minister to people, and I'm going to go talk to, you know, freak people out at the, at the, at the mall and tell them about Jesus and all that, whatever. You know, it's <laughs> like the sky's the limit, and all this is our playground, right? Um, to, to, to not just eke by and survive, you know, to have life and to live it to the full. So, uh, so anyways, he starts getting all fired up and everything. I was like, yeah, that's, that's a good point, man. And uh, I was like, model it, brother. Just model it. You know, to shepherd means teacher, leader, protector. The way you shepherd is I'm going and you're invited. And if you tell them, if you show them, they remember. And if you tell them, they forget. So show them. Go show them. And he's like, right on, brother. This is awesome, man. And then he just honored me by telling me this story. He goes, thanks for coming alongside me. As a matter of fact, my best memory of you, because I was a TD instru uh, TDC instructor. So yeah. within the CIA, they have GRS, Global Response Staff. You've seen 13 hours, you know that. Within... <clears throat> Can I say this? I think I can say it. Uh, they'll let me know if I can't. Um, there's, there's a CIA, then there's GRS. And in GRS, there's a thing called TDC, Tactical Development Course, that anybody goes through, they have to go through to have that job and that honor yeah. of protecting yep. people. Yep. And the people who teach that are the SPT, the Special Projects Team. So I was a Special Projects Team, one of two main instructors, you know, had to teach all those guys. So they're uh, lead instructors, meaning that we can teach anything um, and certified and all that other stuff. <clears throat> great, great team, one of the best teams I've ever been on at one point. Um, but he said, one of my best memories was that, man, I was struggling through the run. And Jimmy Graham came back for me and ran and encouraged me. And, I, and I'll be honest, I don't remember that. I remember running with him, but I didn't remember he wasn't going to make it. Okay. But he said yeah. that there yeah. was the reason I, that he made the run. I was like, that, that meant a lot. And he's like, once again, come alongside me. I was like, man, that's cool. And I go, that's what we do, man. And now that we've reconnected, you got my number. So, Oh, that's great. Got you, brother. Great news. So good dude. So. Kevin, I know you're going to watch it, so I appreciate the call, man. And what I tell you, he said, thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the call today. And I said, what did I say? What did I say? <laughs> I, I don't want to mess it up because it was, it was just a cool exchange through, through brothers, and I don't think enough men talk like this. Um, I responded. And before you even read it, yeah. I know all of your actions come from a place of love. So now I want to hear it. <laughs> um, Thank you, brother. Thank you for your time and mentorship today. Simply put, thank you for coming alongside me today. Stay connected. I said, I'm honored to have earned the phone call, my brother. Have a great rest of your week. Um, we've said that. Yeah. And I'm not saying this about him. I'm just saying you never know who's hanging by a thread. Yeah. Yep. So you spend your lifetime earning that phone call from somebody who's hanging by a thread, right? Because unfortunately, I've gotten a lot of those calls and... Um, if your phone don't ring, nobody's me, right? Yeah, yep. And that may be all they need, right? So your one word at any given time can make the difference either way. And you'll, you may never know, right? So I've, I've lost buddies and I'd wish I'd have gotten a call and I just lost track of them for years and years and then heard that, 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 was, uh, that they weren't around anymore and it was self-inflicted and that's horrible, right? Yep. And then the guilt comes with that. But then also I've been called in the middle of the night. Hey, brother, you sleeping? Nope, I'm not up. Anymore. What's up? Yep. You know? How do you talk to God? I guess we're putting coffee on. You're not going back to bed. Right? Yeah. And it's an honor. And I'm not yeah. complaining one bit. Right? So live your life to earn that phone call. Because the credibility of trust is going up and you spend an entire lifetime building character and one word can blow it. And you yes. might not get it back. Final words, my brother. Final words. Gosh, in a way, a lot of this is all coming together. Um, I'm trying to remember something you said in the way back one machine. 30 days without food. Three days without water. Three minutes without oxygen. You have three seconds 
without a bullet. When you need it. <laughs> Again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's getting real, folks. Yeah. Um, I hate to say it. I had a, a call. Um, somebody in Arizona. And he's like, what do I do? Somebody just walked into my neighbor's house, held a gun to her head, said, we're not here to hurt you. We're here to rob you. Now, this person's 85 years old and wants to go shopping for a Glock. Wow. Right? It's getting real when people are wondering who's coming through my door next. And, you know, I, I know there's a big focus on young children. They can't protect themselves. But another no-touch no zone is elderly people, mm-hmm. right? You don't hurt your elders. And it's, it just broke my heart to have that conversation. And then I, it made me realize through all these years of training how much thought and preparation has to go into each aspect. Like, you can't just have a gun. You have to have bullets. You have to store them safely. You have to have a holster. You have to have training. You're married. That other person has to have all of that as well. Yeah. How are you going to move inside of a dark house? Not fast. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> so, final thoughts. Yeah. It's... It breaks my heart a little bit to have to hear that story, but provide some advice. And, uh, um, yeah, three seconds. And it's, and it's, it is heartbreaking, right? Yeah. And that, that went to guard, you know, the guard your heart. And a lot of Christians say, I'm, I got to guard my heart. I can't look at that stuff. I kind of get it, but I disagree, right? Because yeah. one translation says, keep your heart. Um, one translation that I saw says, keep your heart. And what I believe that to mean is to build a heart strong enough so that you can look at it. But if you look at it, you'll never be the same. But something just happened, and now you have to act, right? Because yeah. if you can't look at it, you can't deal with it. If you can't deal with it, nobody can deal with it, doesn't get dealt with. And what people can do to other people, the beheadings, the videos I've seen already, yeah. Yeah. with a hoe, right, and a full swing, chopping off a dude's head and he's still alive. The report that I read that, and, and this is graphic, and you should hear it. So if you're going to run out of the room, then so be it, because you're not going to deal with it anyway. The, um, and, and this is something I would tell to my children, the older children, because they need to understand this, is um, there was a woman that was from raised in, I think, New Jersey, uh, and 20 years in Israel now, and she was one of these just amazing people that try to give the dead dignity, and they clean their bodies and prepare them for, you know, burial and all that stuff. And when they're finding people that are violated, women, children, elderly, so ravaged, just ravaged so violently that they're, they have broken pelvises. Oh, right. And I know just from, from what I know of this thing, it's typically the, the, the terror and the violence from terrorists. They're trying to make the loudest statement they can. So children is, it's the, and elderly, that is the thing. That's yeah. like, if you kill a dude, whatever, it's, you know, it's, it's, whatever. Um, so it's putting oversized things in there as hard as you can. And, and it was very common in every war about genitalia being cut off and shoved in dude's mouths, right? Yeah. So that kind of stuff is just, it's a statement of evil. And there's, there's zero, like, just the fact that I believe that people are made in the image of God, right? That shouldn't happen. No. You shouldn't eat people. You shouldn't slaughter people, whatever. I do think you need to neutralize threats, and I don't, and I don't think that's a sin, right? There's some just, and that's biblical, that sometimes it's just... Jason, the 86 would put it this way, and it just made all the sense in the world. If you do that to my wife and kids, we can't be neighbors anymore. <laughs> we, can't, we can't go back to living like it nope. was before. We just can't, right? Yeah. Um, and if people are capable of doing that kind of atrocity, there, there must be people. And, you know, and everybody made fun of it, or the, the, the other side did, about the uh, NRA saying, well, it's a bad guy with a gun, you're a good guy with a gun. And that's, that's the, the rated G diet version of that. Mm-hmm. But, but what it means is that if men are capable of evil— you know, then you need good men capable of, of good. Like, like the gun doesn't care. You know, like the gun is like Dave Ramsey, you're talking about money, holds up a brick, and he says, um, I can build a hospital or I can throw it through that plate glass window. The brick yeah. doesn't care, right? That gun can, you know, the person can do good or it can do evil with that. So it could go rob a bank or it could defend your homeland, yeah. right? The gun doesn't care. But it means you know this, we know this, we say this all the time. To get to them, you have to go through me, and that's hard. And if it's not hard, it's winner take all. Yeah. Have a rifle. Have a pistol. Get training and know how to use it like an extension of your body. Then go buy other guns. If you got 20 guns, sell 18 of them if you can't run two of them. Learn how to use them. Right? Yeah. Learn how to use them. Uh, 
Always, but you have as many guns as you want. Like, but a pistol and a rifle, uh, back to that thing of formidable, a man should be formidable, a woman should be formidable, right? Yep. Um, because it's our duty, it's our honor, and it's our privilege to protect those in our care. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. God bless each and every one of you. Take care of one another.